Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me come speak here at this uh, event, which is uh, very very interesting and uh, really glad to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to uh, talk about t t today is some uh, work we're doing, and actually just to mention here, some work. Uh, Sort of my thing about this began in, in a collaboration with uh, Dan Hunt Locker, uh, Cornell, and Yuri Leskovich, and uh, Ashton Anderson at Stanford, um, looking at some of the issues I'll be telling you about in a second. Uh, and then, sort of from there, it continued on into some uh, joint work, which will be uh, in the latter part of this talk with Segal or Oren. Um, and actually, continuing on to some ongoing work uh, that Segal and I have been doing with uh, a Berkeley undergrad here, Manish Raghavan, which I'll put as a bullet in the last slide. Um, so, the kind of issue I wanted to, to talk about here is um, that one thing we've been seeing in the, in the online world is this growth in systems where users have these very long lifetimes in the system, where, where in effect, rather than just think about a sort of snapshot of the network or a snapshot of what you're doing at this moment or what you're consuming at this moment, you think about this person as sort of imagining that they have a long career on the site, uh, and they actually and they sort of and they set goals correspondingly and they respond to incentives correspondingly. So, for example. Wikipedia, where you see this very large community, right? If we don't think about the articles, but about the people producing them, um, we see a community where people can, for example, log up to say 10,000 edits on the system. At which point they come up for promotion to this uh, system administrator role, and you can actually watch because Wikipedia um, really sort of relentlessly chronicles absolutely everything that happens on the site. You can see actually the deliberations about someone's promotion to the adminship role. They submit the equivalent of a CV. It looks sort of like a tenure case, um, and that's all going on sort of behind the scenes of Wikipedia, right? People who really have invested a lot of time in this. Similarly, the kinds of goals people set for themselves on educational sites, uh, the kinds of question answering that you see on Stack Overflow, where again people develop expertise. Uh, I'll talk about that as well. So I want to talk about sort of how people's long-range decision making, uh, how we might try to model some of that in these in these systems. Um, the sort of guiding framework um, is really, rather than think about the you know, network of what's going on explicitly, we're going to think about the state space that people are traversing. Right? So we imagine that there's some large state space of activities I could do on the site, and my career in the system is some kind of traversal through that, that, that state space. Um, and in that state space, we can say effort incurs cost, but you're heading toward various re rewards. Now, some of the rewards might be intrinsic, just you doing what you were trying to get done on the site. Others might be things that the site designer puts into the system. Um, and one of those kinds of re rewards that we see in a lot of these domains, including all of these, are systems of badges. They say, if you do this much of this activity, uh, you'll get some kind of a prize, a reward, a badge. Um, different sites do this in, in different ways. But you can think of them as sort of ways of trying to steer behavior on the site. And there are lots of ways of thinking about how badges might operate, ranging from the social psychological up to the uh, game theoretic. Um, so I want to talk about uh, how these rewards work in these systems. And again, sort of talking about uh, two lines of work, it, beginning with, with this work with uh, Ashton Anderson, Dan Hottenlocker, and Yuri Leskovich, where we, we sort of start by trying to understand how do badges work in these systems, right? How is it that people's behavior is, is being steered by them? Um, we looked at two domains in particular uh, on Stack Overflow, uh, where we tried to look at the effect of some of these badges. And secondly, uh, some interventions that we did on Coursera, where we tried to help them deploy badges in their forums. Uh, and then secondly, some more theoretical work that uh, uh, I've been doing with Segal Oren, um, Look at how this planning works when we think about some of the behavioral biases that we know that people exhibit uh, and how we can take that into account. Okay, um, so just to kind of make sure we all have sort of a consistent picture, let me talk about uh, just briefly Stack Overflow where we did some of this analysis. So the idea with Stack Overflow, and many of you have uh, used it, I certainly use it regularly for implementation questions I have that come up. I, uh, I do it as a consumer, and that's in fact a lot of how Stack Overflow was intended, right? So it's a question answering site. Some people more adventurous than me actually come and ask questions to the community, like this person is trying to compute connected components in a graph with 100 million nodes. And so they pose the question, uh, and then there are some answers to the question. And so there are sort of a number, this was not me, no, I, as I said, there's someone much braver than me because I, I just go and hope someone's already asked it so I can just kind of lurk in the shadows and consume the answer. Um, but uh, so the, um, the things to know, so there's a question, there are some answers, and there are votes, right? So people upvote the answer to say, I think this is a good answer. Uh, and you might also notice, maybe the sort of least visible to normal users of the site is you can also upvote the questions. 
And that's important for them because they actually think of themselves as not just answering questions in real time, but producing resources for shy people like me who just want to come and read them you know, up to a year later and not have to like, ask the community directly. OK, so that's, uh, that's kind of a picture of the Stack Overflow page. And Implicit in this is actually that the designers of the site might want more of certain kinds of activities and less of others, right? More answers, maybe fewer questions, or at least more answers per question. Uh, more voting, more adding of this metadata so we know which is the good content on the site. We'd like to do all of that. Um, and so we sort of imagine that there's this interaction going on between the site designer and the population of users, right? The site designer has a certain ideal mix of activities that they would like to see. They like to see exactly the right mix of answers per question, of voting, of, of other things going on. Um, the users just want to get done what they want to get done. Some people are there to get their questions answered. Some people are there to display their expertise and to help others. Um, and you know, these, these people have, have, have these motivations. And so the question is, how does that interaction work? Right? The designer has the ability to introduce incentives into the site to, to, to try steering, steering behavior. And so when Ashton, Dan, Yuri, and I were thinking about this, you know, we thought it would be kind of nice if we could have some kind of abstract model of people traversing a state space of activities, asking and answering and voting and all these things, right? And so people's lives would sort of be these trajectories of, um, of paths through this state space. And we sort of felt like we would know we were on the right track uh, with thinking about these incentives if we could actually sort of see the trajectory sort of bending towards certain incentives. And in a way, we first stumbled upon this idea of modeling this way precisely in this way. We were visual, trying to find different ways of visualizing people's lifetimes on the, th you know, on the system, and we noticed you know, there were sort of people following these sort of flow lines through the system, and they were actually sort of, you know, sort of warping in certain parts of the space. We're like, you know, what's going on here? And it was almost like there was sort of a gravitating body that was sort of warping them. Uh, and when you looked closely, it turned out there was a badge there that someone had set up, you know, and that was actually sort of bending all of their behavior toward it. And so we thought, okay, you know, can we come up with a model that as simply as possible has, has that kind of uh, steering activity? So here was the first model that we, uh, suggested for how badges might work. Um, I'll sort of sp sp spell this out so you, you can see what some of the issues are. Uh, and then again, I'll sort of move on to sort of some of the richer ways of trying to model what, what users are actually doing here. So again, we have a state space, which means uh, in our case, we just have a, a set of actions that you can do. So there's action of type one, action of type two, and so forth. And maybe if we want to keep the running example stack overflow, uh, you know, asking and answering and voting and so forth. So therefore, a user's state is n-dimensional. Um, Imagine that a user has some preferred distribution of what they'd like to do. So there are actually a bunch of ways of modeling what the user might be, uh, how the user might be operating on the site. This turned out to be sort of a nice one, um, uh, even though it has a, a bit less choice, a bit more randomness. So essentially, you know, in this 2D state space, a user is going to go right with P, probably P1 and up with probably P2. Right, they're going to do an action of type 1 or an action of type 2. And so a user's lifetime in the system is just this little particle moving up into the right. Right, everyone just kind of moves random walk up into the right. Uh, and then the user has some finite lifetime. They exit the system with probability delta at each step, right? Because maybe they change jobs and their new job is much more time demanding, not have time for stack overflow, you know, whatever it is. But there might just be some reason why they just have to leave. And that, of course, creates a natural discounting of, of the future, right? So up and to the right, and then they just evaporate with some probability. Okay. Uh, on top of this, we're going to put badges. And so a badge is basically any monotone subset of the state space, as in once you're in the subset, you stay in the subset as you keep going up and to the right. So the blue badge says if you're right of here, you get a badge. The red line says if you're up here, you get the red badge. Right? So it says a blue badge and a red badge. Uh, and there's a reward that gets conferred when you actually get the badge. All right. So now a user has to choose what is their distribution of reactions going to be. They have a preferred distribution P, but they could choose any distribution they want. So they could choose some other distribution X. Um, particularly, they, maybe they want to get the badge more quickly, so they choose some other x. Now, when they choose a different distribution, that comes at some cost, uh, g of xp, because, which, say, has cost zero when you're doing your preferred distribution. And for any other distribution, the more you have to deviate from what you want to be doing, the more cost you incur. All right. So with this setup, the user now faces an optimization problem. How would they like to behave in the site as a function of where they are, um, where they are in the state space? All right, and their choice is how to is to pick a distribution so as to achieve all the different re rewards, the badges, not incurring cost from deviating from what they want to do, um, and uh, effectively they're solving the following optimization problem. Um, so they're trying to choose in each state a, right? So in a given state here, a distribution which has n dimensions. In this case, two two dimensions. What are their probabilities? Um, and then optimize the following utility, which actually, uh, although I wrote it out in this long form, is pretty simple to decompose, right? There are three terms to it. So there's the badges they've won, that confers utility. 
There's the cost they incur from not doing what they want to be doing. Uh, and then there's the recursively the value in the future. Right? That, that, that's their value right now. Uh, with probably one minus delta, they survive to the next step, and they have this dynamic programming re recurrence. Right? With probably xa to the i, they go in dimension i, in which case they now evaluate their utility here. Okay. And so, again, it's sort of designed to sort of as simply as possible to incorporate you know, what I want to be doing, the value from badges, and my thinking about the future. Um, as a dynamic program, it's not actually that hard to solve, although there's one twist, which is you know, we always teach, you know, figure out the base case for your dynamic program and then build up from there. Um, here, the problem is that you know, when I'm here, I'm recursively thinking about these two states, and when I'm there, I'm thinking about those states, and it sort of it extends out to infinity. Um, so we, we have to do a, be a, a bit careful to somehow ground the induction somewhere out, out, out here. And the trick basically is that once I'm past all the badges, uh, the site, if there's a finite set of badges, the site designer has lost all control over my behavior. And so I sort of know what will happen out there, and then I can start sort of marching backwards. So again, you know, we thought, is this going to actually produce this kind of bending that we saw when we visualized people's activities on, on the site, right? The, 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 this idea that as you, as you got near the badge, it was like this sort of gravitating body that was pulling you. Um, and if you try out some solutions to this numerically, right, so uh, you actually see that that's, that's exactly what's happening in this model. So uh, in the next slide, we just sort of made up some you know, numbers for what the cost function should be, what, the, what delta should be, and so forth. Uh, and this is what you actually see as the vector field of what people are doing at every point in the state space, right? So they start out here, and they have some preferred direction. Again, a direction here is a probability, probability of one, probability of two. Um, we can actually tell what their preferred direction is because once they're past the two badges, they, we have no control of them. They, they just keep going that way. And you see at the very beginning, they kind of do what they want to be doing because why? Because this one minus delta term uh, says, I, I'm likely to leave the system before I ever get to the badge. The badge is so far off, what are my real chances of actually getting the badge? I'll just do what I want to be doing. But as you survive longer and longer, the notion of winning this badge becomes more and more real to you. Right? And so, you know, as you start, you know, and if you sort of randomly flipped a few more heads than tails and you're over here, this badge is much more salient than that badge because it's, it's not so discounted anymore. You really might get it. And so you begin actually at optimality torquing your behavior so you get to this. Of course, once you're through this badge, now what's sailing to this badge and so forth. Okay. So again, what's, what was sort of intriguing to us is that these kinds of arguments that you know, rewards acquire salience as you ne near them is definitely a, a big topic in uh, cognitive psychology. So things like the gold gradient hy hypothesis argue that badges are salient as you, as you approach them because you're trying to reach closure on some long-running task that you've completed or that you've started. Um, what's, what was interesting to us is that here it's arising purely just from a dynamic programming solution, right? The agent isn't sort of actually thinking, you know, why would I try for it? The agent isn't actually thinking, boy, it looks so real now. The agent is simply optimizing something with exponential discounting, but that's, of course, going to, going to have the same effect. Okay. Um, and you, you can uh, project this onto one dimension. This is sort of what it looks like if you're approaching a badge on A1. You know, so as you do more and more actions, the badge here is at 25, you're going to ramp up. Of course, as you punch through the badge boundary, you're going to drop back to what you were doing. That's actually one case where we differed sort of sharply with the psychological theories like Gold Gradient. Those theories tend to say there's also a, an effect of learning going on, that as you do this activity more and more, action A1, you say, you know, I actually kind of like this action. I've become habituated to doing it. Once I get the badge, I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, whereas this optimization uh, argument says you're going to drop back to what you, what you were doing. And of course, we expect it'll be different in different domains. It's not so much to say one or the other is right, but to notice that that's actually uh, two very, very, very original con consequences of these theories. So we can go into uh, Stack Overflow. Which one do you see in Stack Overflow? Do Good question, see? yeah. So next slide, I'll show you a picture. Doesn't that distinction arise because your P, your preferred distribution, is independent of the state? Like, shouldn't it? Yeah. It could be allowed to evolve. Uh, and that's actually an important thing. Uh, this dynamic program is extremely general. So if you wanted this to be P sub A, it would be the same. Yeah. And then you might see that, exactly. Um, so it, it certainly, one could, one could build that in. Uh, you could say states beyond this now have that learning thing built in, and you actually now like doing it. Would, and we could totally put that in. It is a good question, what happens on Stack Overflow? I'll show you uh, the, the two badges that sort of most perfectly, at the time we looked at, when Stack Overflow had, had many fewer badges than it does now, the two that most perfectly fit this model of sort of cumulative milestones without lots of other bells and whistles uh, were badges for voting. Uh, so one was the civic duty badge, which said if you vote 300 times, 
you get a badge. And the other was the electorate badge, which said if you vote 600 times on questions, you also get an even bigger badge. Uh, or at least a badge that's harder to get because that's 600 question votes, not just 300 total votes. Um, and so here's what it looked like as people approached uh, those badges. And so I, I tried to draw the pictures sort of in the same way, but this is from the actual Stack Overflow data. So this is uh, actions would have done the same thing. It turned out to the curves were a bit easier to interpret if you did number of days relative to badge wins. So here, everybody who's ever won a, a civic duty badge for 300 votes, we've aligned all of their life histories so that time zero is for everybody the day they won the badge. Uh, right? And, you, and you, you see this ramping up on the two things that are being rewarded by the badge, question votes and answer votes. Um, the other two activities that are unbadged for, by this thing rem, remain flat. So locally in the part of the state space that's in the vicinity of the badge, you don't see an effect on these. You do see a sharp effect on these. Um, and you do see a pretty rapid relaxation to some base rate. Um, and uh, since I'm moving quickly through this, I'm ha happy to talk afterwards about uh, some of the other issues that we looked at here. Um, you also notice with the electorate badge, right, it's very clear only this is being rewarded. There's a gigantic cliff uh, at the end of this one. It's also, and it's sort of hard to tell exactly, but uh, if, if you're asking, as they do this, what are they stealing activity from, right? So here, they're doing more of this. They're not doing less of anything else. Arguably, they're just doing more stack overflow activity. Um, here, similarly, although you could argue that uh, they're doing a little less, uh, as, as they vote more in questions, a little bit less voting on answers. Which hints, although it's sort of hard to tell from the amount of data we have, but it, it sort of hints at some interesting conjecture about mental categorization, right? If I have to vote more on questions and I have to steal activity from something, what should I steal it from? It should be the other activity that involves voting, but not the red and the blue activities, which are actually about writing text. Again, a conjecture more than a, anything else. Okay, so a bunch of questions that you could ask here. Um, I'll, I'll mention one which actually I think is, is a nice question and we don't have a, a great understanding of how to solve it. Uh, what you might call the, 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 the badge placement problem. Almost sort of a facility location problem in state space where I say I'm allowed to define some fixed number of badges with some fixed set of re rewards. I'd like to do it in a way that steers activity in, the, in some pattern that I desire as the site designer. And so I specify here's the cumulative distribution of activities I would like on the site. I have a limited vocabulary of badges. I can place them however I want. Uh, how should I do that? Um, I think an interesting, uh, interesting algorithmic problem, um, which I think fits naturally in this model. A second question that we, we asked about, yeah? On this interesting model, I mean, to think about it as a, as a facility location, you have to have a model of what will happen after you design the badge. Yeah, yeah. And like, just the same way the people didn't imagine that they ever get up to the badge, right. I would guess, maybe I'm wrong, that the site designers don't really imagine how much people will or will not answer on the site. Do you, do you think people will know this ahead of time? So the, this is, of course, the, the interesting question. Is there going to be enough uh, data arising from this? I feel like as these sites deploy more and more badges, or with early stack overflow, it's very hard to tell from these examples. Um, you know, so the hope would be, and again, it's, it's been harder than it looked, so it's a, it's a very valid question, that if you look at things in the vicinity of badge wins, you're seeing something about how much more salient is the badge when I'm this far from it than when I'm that far from it. So I'm getting some kind of effective slope uh, on pe people's awareness of the badge, which might help me uh, a little bit. But it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so maybe I'm misinterpreting the plots. It feels like there's a bit of selection bias here. So there's obviously a lot of people who maybe got close to the badge and didn't win. Never won it, yeah. I guess I'm, so it just feels different than what you were talking about on the previous slide, right? The previous slide is sort of saying, if I- As you approach it, it's gonna, close, yeah. I'll exert more effort. So it seems like what, what I would wanna see is, among the pool of people who got close to a badge win. Right, how much is that? Which is not, am I right? That's not possible to read off from here? Or? Not possible to, to, to read off from here, yeah. That, that's something we've looked at a bit with the reputation score. We have a much, much more fine-grained control over as you approach <laughs> reputational milestones. Um, one sees some of that, but it's a, that's also yeah, a very good question. The axes are different between this and the previous period. Well, this is days versus actions. Right. Yeah. Actions. Yeah, time versus actions does not make a big difference. So that. Really? So, so you don't accelerate either? I mean, you don't. You, don't you accelerate both in actions and you, you do more actions per day and you also accelerate ordinarily in actions. Yeah, this so. means that, uh, that this, uh, this axis is elongated uh, close to the. In a sense, yeah. yeah. Um, do you see any evidence that there's, like, you were changing their underlying preference distribution. Like in the left plot, it looks like the yellow line ends up higher than it started. Is that statistically significant? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, again, the, the question is what it's relaxing to in the long run versus uh, where it is here. Um, the sense is that 
And again, it's, it's sort of hard to tell as you, as you move further away. When you're right here, this is significant. But as, as you move further out, there's not necessarily much evidence that it's permanently higher. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, do you see sample selection bias? Do you see people answering easier questions? Yeah, so we looked at actually, this was one thing we looked at. So the quality, so as you get close to the badge win, do you see, for example, less upvoting of the, because uh, we have some quality measure of, 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 of your answers. Um, or do you see in the, the voting, do, do you see people sort of doing the easy ones, like they vote on things that already have a lot of votes? Um, not much evidence of that, but there, it feels like there's something there ought to be, ought to be the case. Um, but the sort of obvious checks for like, are people just sort of finding the easy things and doing them as fast as possible, not to, um, uh, yeah, but that's definitely something that we went, 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 went looking for. Yeah. Um, and then there's also this other question just, right, how are badges deriving their value anyway, right? So, you know, is the reason that I'm seeing people, um, uh, that other people have badges and I want to be like them, uh, is it that I'm, you know, sort of it's providing me with my own motivation? Uh, is it transactional? Once I have a badge on certain sites, it unlocks certain abilities and therefore there's a very concrete payoff uh, from, from getting them. Um, these are all also interesting open questions. Um, one thing we did to just try helping our own thing about this was when we worked with Coursera to introduce badges in, into the forum, we actually there did try a randomized experiment with different presentations of the badges to different random subsets of the population. So the idea was on the forums, uh, you're, you're going to get badges for, um, you know, for uh, reading forum posts, for providing answers that get lots of upvotes, and a, a bunch of other things. And so we presented the badges in different ways. So here was, here was one presentation. It said you can get a bronze, silver, gold, or diamond badge uh, for either for reading posts, for voting, uh, for getting upvoted posts, and, and for other things. Um, and so you presented this badge ladder. Um, for a random subset of the population, uh, we also, when you went on the forum, you saw everybody's badges on their byline. So you saw not just the name, but you also saw what badges they had. And the interesting thing there <clears throat> was that actually, to a statistically significantly higher uh, extent, there was more forum usage from the people who saw this presentation than who just saw the names. All right, so making the badges salient in the bylines of other people actually was, uh, you know, in the random sample which had that uh, was producing higher effect. Actually. Similarly, one, one can do this presentation, or we can just say, you know, you have some badges. Uh, the idea with this presentation, which we sort of uh, uh, tried to make the progress more salient, um, again, making that more salient also uh, produced a higher effect. So, you know, one, one question is, you know, how to tease apart why these effects are happening. Is it just through increasing awareness of them? Is it through activating social cues? Also, I think an interesting question, but I, I think there is a sort of interesting challenge in trying to understand how badges are, are deriving their value. Um, so let me talk a bit about modeling of people's uh, the sort of long-range planning behavior because what I've been talking about so far is this very simple model of the future where I'm optimizing and I'm d discounting the future you know to some extent geometrically um, but we can also think about you know cases where something more complicated seems to be happening right so what we've been talking about so far is we have these multi-step plans uh, an agent is choosing the optimal sequence given the cost and benefits. One question is, you know, why is this not a perfect model for what's going on? One, of course, is that the cost and benefits may just not be known to the user. They may be changing over time. You know, so for example, the Tacoma public school system, which uh, created this interesting treasure map for how to earn a uh, high school uh, diploma, you know, sort of described all the kind of, you know, quicksand and the treasure chest and all the things along the way. You know, it could be that one reason why you don't finish your high school diploma is simply because while you're in middle high school, your parents both lose their jobs, you need to start earning income for your family, all sorts of unexpected things happen. Um, but sometimes it seems like you change your mind even though the costs and benefits seem to have remained the same the whole time. Right? And that wouldn't be uh, explainable by some kind of fixed optimization problem. If, if in the beginning you thought it was optimal to embark on this plan and the cost structure and the reward structure didn't change, why are you now abandoning it halfway through? Why are you doing something differently halfway through? Right? And that's uh, what, uh, what uh, behavioral scientists refer to as time inconsistency. Um, probably high school graduation is less the obvious place to see it. Uh, the probably the most obvious place to see it is something like gym membership. Right? At the start of the month you think, this is going to be great. I'm going to join the gym, I'm going to get lots of exercise, it's going to be just a great investment of my 19 pounds, uh, 95. And, uh, and so, but then, you know, once you join the gym, you know, the month starts and on the first few days you realize you don't actually like the idea of, you know, the idea of 
getting up at 6.30 in the morning to go do this just doesn't seem so appealing, and so you don't do it. And time goes on, and the gym has pocketed another uh, person's monthly membership. Um, again, you know, it's not that three days in you sprained your ankle and couldn't do it. It's, you know, you knew in advance you would be having to get up at 6.30 a.m. It just didn't seem as appealing when the time came to actually do it. Now, that's not a behavior I'm going to be able to get out of some kind of geometric discounting where I say, here's, you know, the reward is being physically fit, the cost is getting up at 6.30 a.m., time is discounted. You would have made up a plan, and you would have followed that plan. That is not what happened here. You made a plan, you didn't stick to it. Um, there are a lot of sort of examples. So, sort of, this is something which people have attempted or uh, have proposed a number of models for in uh, the, the behavioral economics literature. Um, one of the simplest stories uh, actually comes from this uh, very nice uh, short paper by the Nobel laureate George Akerlof, where he begins with a story. Uh, and the story is, why did George Akerlof not make it to the post office? So the idea was, uh, so he was on sabbatical in India. Uh, and as the sabbatical neared its end, he had this giant cardboard box of things he had to send back to the uh, US. And um, actually, it was for a friend of his who needed it. And there was a, sort of a lot of extra details to the story. The basic issue was that he had to ship it in one of the final end days of his sabbatical in India. Uh, it's, it was going to be a costly proposition to ship it because what do you have to do? You have to go to the post office. You have to wait in this very long line. You have to fill out lots of forms, lots of customs information. You know, you're going to lose a half day doing this. It's a real pain. So there's this one-time effort cost of C to ship it. Um, on the other hand, do not, you know, it's going to have to get there eventually. And every day it's not being shipped, there's a loss of use cost because it's not at the other end. So you're paying some small amount X every single day you don't ship it. Okay. Um, so he had to decide when to ship it. And uh, just to spell this out, he faced this intriguing optimization problem that if he ships it on day T, his cost is the one-time cost C plus Tx. And just to kind of shortcut to the end, the optimum for that is actually T equals 1. Uh, you should ship it on, on the first day. OK, so that's what he should have done. Uh, but that's not what he did. Uh, what he did is what maybe a number of us can relate to. He procrastinated. So each day, he didn't do it that day, because there were other things that just seemed kind of you know, worth doing that day. He planned he would do it tomorrow. Actually, he makes a point of this in the paper, which is going to be important for later. It's not that he planned to do it sometime. He planned he would do it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> And the effect, of course, is you wait until day end when, it, at that point, you have to ship it. And so you do. You incur the cost of C anyway. You, you all kind of know this, right? So we've all experienced this. Um, actually, the story has a few more twists and turns. Halfway in, 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 into this, some friends of his took pity on him and just they took it to the post office. So it didn't quite end this way. OK. So he did something that all of us you know, have done in similar situations. But he also did something that maybe all of us haven't done, which is he tried to model his own behavior here. Um, so here was the idea. He was actually drawing on work uh, from the behavioral sciences from several decades earlier, the idea being that costs incurred today are more salient. Let's imagine that we simply add one tiny feature to the story, that anything I'm going to incur today is raised by this factor of b greater than 1. Okay. So any cost I'm going to incur today looks different from all the future costs. No, this is not discounting. Right? Discounting says the future looks like a 1 minus delta shrunken copy of the present, and that's just going to continue recursively all the way. You know, and so I just see this kind of vanishing, exponentially decaying view of the future. That's not this. This says today is different from every, every other day. You could add discounting on top of this if you wanted, but discounting treats every day as a, as a fixed decay. Okay. What effect does that have? It actually does exactly what the procrastinating agent in the story would do. If you send it today, your cost is b times c. Right? b is bigger than 1, c is big. If you send it tomorrow, you get b times x. x is, uh, right, so x is a small number. Uh, so it's entirely possible that b times c is bigger than bx plus c. That happens as long as you get this inequality. And so that actually the optimum would be not to send it today incurring bc, but to send it tomorrow incurring bx plus c. Right? Certainly not the day after tomorrow, because you would just add, pointlessly add an extra x term. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the best choice. Right? OK, so that's the idea. Now, th this grew into a very large uh, area in behavioral e economics um, on time and consistency and present bias, right? the bias toward cost in the present. Um, the sort of core reference for this model I'm talking about here uh, is this notion of quasi-hyperbolic discounting due to David Labeson, where essentially a cost or reward C realized T units in the future has a present value that some fixed multiplier beta times the discounting factor times C. Our special case here is just that delta is 1. We're not discounting. Uh, B is just the same as the inverse of beta. Uh, and also, one crucial point, which will be true throughout the rest of what I'm going to say uh, in the final part of this talk, uh, the agent is naive about, about their bias, as in they believe that tomorrow they won't experience the bias. 
Um, that's an interesting point, which I'll mention on, on the final slide. We're doing, trying to do something about. Okay. The nice thing with this model is you can model a bunch of ways in which people reason badly about time. One is procrastination, as we just saw. A second one uh, in this nice paper of O'Donoghue and Rabin is task abandonment. You start a project, right? So you start this uh, eight-chapter monograph, which is going to be great, and you write the first three chapters in a burst of enthusiasm, and then without much in particular changing in the world, you just somehow never quite finish, and it sits there on your hard drive, uh, and all that effort went to waste. Um, and similarly, the benefits of choice reduction. If you remove options from people, you give them less choice, you can actually make their lives better. Which again, an agent who could plan perfectly, that would make no sense, because optimizing over a larger feasible region should only be better than optimizing over a smaller feasible region. But when, when you try this with people, you often find this is happening. So what was interesting to us was there was a sort of rich literature, but each of these stories was its own kind of intricate construction, right? So each of them, you know, the, the models all, once you got into the specifics, were all slightly different. You had to sort of construct these things carefully. Uh, and we thought to ourselves, you know, is there a way to sort of think comparatively across all of these different s s scenarios, right? Would there be one framework where we sort of ask all these questions, procrastination and task abandonment and choice reduction, all sort of concurrently, right? Or could we ask, you know, as we're fond of doing in theoretical computer science, comparative questions about performance, like uh, things about like the cost ratio, right? So, you know, if I imagine things like the competitive ratio or the price of anarchy, here there'd be a kind of a price of irrationality, price of present bias. You know, what would be the worst possible cost incurred by a present bias agent over the minimum cost, the optimum plan, right? Um, you know, and so you can sort of imagine across the high school graduation story and the gym membership and the post office, across all stories where this has an effect, what's the worst cost ratio? And the obvious problem is I haven't yet formalized things enough to even be able to ask the question. I mean, what am I exactly asking? Am I asking the max overall stories of the cost ratio? I don't really know how to do that. I need some way of saying, let's comparatively talk about any possible domain where this is happening. You know, again, within some constraint set. I'll, I'll make up what the scope of the model is, but at least it should be sort of rich enough to cover the kinds of stories we're talking about. So the idea was to go back to, to state spaces, right? People moving through a state space, traversing a state space, trying to get to a goal. Um, and, you know, let's take away the grid structure and just say, suppose I had an arbitrary directed acyclic graph. An agent starts at S. There are costs on the edges indicating, you know, this is the cost to perform this action. And they're trying to get to state T. All right. And this is a shortest path problem. If, the, if an agent were looking here, they'd say this has a cost of 20. That's the cheapest path. I'll do that. Uh, the one twist I'm going to make is that we're going to introduce present bias. From a given node, the immediately outgoing edges have costs raised by a factor of B. So in my example, let me say B is 2, just because that's, you know, that's a simple uh, thing pedagogically to talk about. So if B were 2 here, this would look like it has cost 32 plus 2 plus 2 is 36. This would look like it has cost 32, and this would have cost 34. You can try out the math. So the agent looking here says, you know, I just don't feel like doing this gigantic in cost of 16, so I'm going to go this way. Right? It's suboptimal in the real cost they're incurring. Because black is the real cost they're incurring. Right? You actually didn't have the box back in the US because you didn't go to the post office. And you actually did lose the $20 because you didn't, you know, and so forth. Right? So the black costs are the actual costs you're incurring. This is what's warping your path. OK, now of course, once they get here, the world looks different. This now looks like it's 8 times 2 plus 8, 24. This looks like it's only 20. So in fact, they go this way. So two things happen in this example. One, they were suboptimal. And two, they didn't even do what they planned when they were standing here. They changed their mind when they got to here, all because things were salient at different points in time. OK. What's interesting is that you can sort of effortlessly, with this graph structure, model a bunch of the stories I've been talking about. Right? This is an arbitrary graph, just for a pedagogical example. This is the George Akerlof story. Right? Here he is on day zero, trying to decide when to go to the post office. Every day, node VI means you reach day three without going to the post office. On any day, you can go straight to the post office incurring a cost of C. Or you can kind of orbit, you can kind of idle, and pay X, and just be back where you started, right? And so his story was one of how he didn't just take the direct route to T. He kind of went all the way around the perimeter and then went to T, incurring the sort of pointless extra cost around the outside. OK, so again, very easy to build these kinds of examples. It's actually sufficiently easy that, let me just uh, uh, add one more thing to the model, which is um, I could say you don't need to get to T. Right? Because I'd like to model other things like task abandonment, in which you have the option of stopping. Right? Three chapters into your eight chapter monograph, you could decide, you know, actually, I just don't feel like doing this. Um, so you could say, all right, there's a reward at node T. Um, and the agent is only going to continue on their path if the cost they perceive to the end is less or equal to the reward that they see at the end. 
So again, with b equals 2, what would happen here? Uh, the agent would say, this path looks like 10. That looks like 11. We're multiplying these up by 2. They're going to go this way. Uh, but they get here, and this looks like 12. And so, in fact, they give up. They just stop because 12 is bigger than 11. And so they put in this effort, and that effort went to waste. So that's task abandonment. And of course, choice reduction is very easy to notice in this model. If someone were to sort of helpfully just delete that node, this would look like 11. It's worth the reward of 11. Maybe it's 11 minus epsilon if you want. And then they go this way. And they actually stick to it because they get here and it looks like 10. And so if I take away your freedom, you actually do better. Um, let me show you one more example because it's very easy to construct these things. Uh, an elaborate story that you can find in the literature on the value of assigning deadlines in classes, again, is just a story about a path in graphs. So uh, the story about deadlines in classes is to say, uh, we all know from, you know, if we've been instructors in courses, you know, you have problem sets. And if you've taught the course a number of years, you sort of roughly know what kinds of questions you want to ask. And yet you have every week a problem set, and it's due the next week. And you could say, well, I know what the questions are in advance. You're all grown-ups. Here are all eight problem sets. Pace yourselves. Hand them all in on your own schedule by the end of the semester, uh, and then you know, they'll be good because you just have more freedom and you can budget your time. And uh, anyone who's tried doing this knows this is a complete disaster because people don't actually start the problem sets, and now you start getting a lot of drama in the final two weeks when there's eight problem sets left to go and there's two weeks left in the class. And the question of you know, why didn't you budget your time better is sort of at this point kind of moot because there's only two weeks left to go. Um, again, present bias sort of makes this sort of very, very easy to see. So you, know, you can imagine there's a... Uh, just to take a simple example, uh, say I had a three-week short course, I had two projects, I get a reward of 16 at the end, uh, and each week that I am in the course, it costs me one to just be in the course, not do any of the two projects. It costs me four to do one of them, it costs me nine to do both of them in the same week. Because right? costs to do things like that are often convex like that. So I just say, all right, node VIJ, V21 here is two weeks have gone by, and I've only done one project. So I won't walk through all of the math here, but you can work out that what someone will do just a graph traversing agent uh, would say, all right, they're going to go here. That looks cheapest. They really should start starting the work, but they don't. They go here because they say, I'm going to just do it all in a big burst at the end, because uh, that looks like the cheapest path to them right now, because it's 2 times 1 plus the 9. They get here, of course. Now they have to do two projects in one week. That's 2 times 9 is 18, not worth the row of 16, and they drop the class. Right? And you could have made their lives easy by just deleting that state. If you delete that state, everything gets better. They actually make it to the end. And what is deleting that state? It's just putting in a deadline. It's saying you must have done the first pro project by the second week of the class. And if you do that, they'll actually finish a class that they would not have finished otherwise. With the lines. Again, the point is actually less to sort of focus on classes and problem sets and deadlines, but just to say that one can really effortlessly tell many, many of the stories in the literature just by constructing the right graph and looking at what a path following agent would do. Now, with graphs, you can do a bunch of things. So we've been sort of talking about the, this one, I'll just sketch uh, a couple of things that we've, we've done in sort of in the final five minutes. Um, one is you actually try characterizing instances with high cost ratios. Um, second one is you can think about this idea of choice reduction is sort of a graph algorithmic problem. How could I optimally reduce your choice in order to help present bias agents complete tasks that I did in those examples? And the third is you could ask sort of how do populations differ when they have different values of B. Um, I'll mainly just talk about this first one here. Um, so, in fact, the cost ratio can be quite bad. The Akerlof story is nowhere near as bad as it could have been. Right? Life could have been worse. It could have been that the cost to do this thing is actually getting exponentially worse as time goes on. But unfortunately for the agent, as long as the C is less than B, the multiplier, at every step, you'd still want to defer just one more. Right? This is a story that we can recognize as almost sort of too painful to contemplate. Right? But it's sort of going on. It's just getting worse and worse. But you still somehow prefer just waiting one more week. Um, so, so here was a question we asked, which, again, we couldn't have asked if we were just talking about stories, but we can ask if we're talking about graphs. Over all instances with a high cost ratio, right, so this is a version of Akerlof's story. Is it the case that any instance with a large, you know, with a high, exponentially high cost ratio must somehow contain Akerlof's story as a substructure? Right? And because we're talking about graphs, that question actually is, can be made well-defined. Right? Must anything with a very large cost ratio have this as a substructure? Uh, here's how we could do that. We could use the notion of graph miners as a definition of substructure. So just to kind of in two slides remind you, by graph miner, I just mean that a, node, a graph H, small graph H, is a miner of a big graph G. If I can take connected subsets of G, like this, contract them into supernodes like this, and get a copy of H. Right? So the point here is that this has a K4 miner, the complete graph on four nodes, because those are my four sets. They're mutually adjacent. Okay. 
what, what might my question be here using the idea of graph miners? So I'll actually scrub out the costs and the directions and say, let's suppose this, and again, there are a bunch of ways we could formalize this question. I think a number of them are actually correct. I'll just tell you about this particularly simple one. If we take away costs and directions, we could say this is sort of the signature of the Akerlof story, right? This fan graph where there's a path with spokes going into a central node. Um, we'll call that the K-fan. And so here's uh, the theorem that Segal and I were able to prove about this model that um, effectively whenever there's an exponential cost ratio, you must have a, a large fan as a graph miner in the instance. So for every lambda greater than one, there's an epsilon, so that if the cost ratio exceeds lambda to the n, then the underlying instance actually has to have a k fan minor where k is epsilon times n. Right? So actually a constant fraction of the whole instance is a picture of the Akerlof story, somewhere embedded in there. Um, our bounds were quite loose, actually, in this follow-up work by Tong et al. There was uh, so some nice work that actually found the sort of tight trade-off in, uh, in this graph minor thing. And the, the, the basic idea here, which I just have only time to go into for one slide, is that essentially, as with all these graph minor construction kinds of arguments, you know, this one was nowhere near as difficult as, as many of them, you basically need to build the minor piece by piece by sort of following what's going on in the graph, right? So in particular, the agent is traversing a path trying to reach t. Its path to the target is getting more and more expensive. And so we can say the rank of the node is basically the sort of integer of the logarithm of its current distance to t. So it has to acquire a gigantic rank as it goes, right? a gigantic log of cost. And what we argue is that every time the rank goes up by one, we actually can identify yet another path that it could have taken to get to t that's separate from the path it's following. And so I basically pull all these together into a super node, look at this, and that's actually my k-fan line. The actual proof is a bit longer than that, but that's, that's the basic idea. OK, let me tell you one more question we asked, and then I'll wrap up. Um, one other question we asked, which I think is still some nice open questions here, is the choice reduction problem. So uh, suppose I have a graph G. It's not traversable by the agent. I'd like to find a subgraph of it that is traversable. Right? That was my story here. Right? The agent would get stuck at the node up top uh, because it no longer wants to get there. If I delete that, it now gets to the target. I'd like to know, when can I do that for a given graph? I can take a graph, I can try the agent, right? they're deterministic, I just see what they do, and I can tell they get stuck. The harder question is, is there a subset of the nodes I can delete so that they make it all the way through? Can I produce a traversable instance? Now, when we first saw this question, we thought, okay, this won't be that hard, because you know, surely, if there's a traversable subgraph, that means in that traversable subgraph, there's a path they follow. And if we could just delete maybe everything but that path, then maybe they'll just follow it. Or if not that path, maybe some path. It sort of felt like if there were a traversable subgraph, there ought to be one that's just a path. I mean, that's sort of true in almost any sort of model of pathfinding that you tend to think about. But that's not the case in this model. So we discovered this graph, which is quite intriguing. Um, this graph has the property that it's traversable, but no path in it is traversable. Right? So what do I mean by that? When you're here, you say, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm, I'm planning to reach the target because this is 2 times 2 plus 6 plus 2 is 12, which is at most the reward of 12. So I move on to A. I get to A, and now this looks like 2 times 6 plus 2 is 14. That's too difficult. But suddenly this path comes to the rescue. This looks like 2 times 3 plus 6, which is 12. And so I continue on, I make it to the target. Right? So without node B here, I would never get to A. And without node C here, I would never continue onward from A. Right? We, we sort of thought about, is this really a fact about graphs, or is this too somehow a story that was sort of latent in the, uh, the world. I guess in the end we convince ourselves it is sort of a story that's latent in the world, right? I mean, this is essentially the convincing your six-year-old child to take violin lessons by showing them YouTube videos of violin prodigies performing in concerts. And they think to themselves, oh, wow, if I take up the violin, I'm going to become a violin prodigy and perform in concerts, imagining this path. And then you get here and you realize, you know, actually, that's going to take like a lot of practice every day. That's really hard. But by then, they actually are, they enjoy the violin, and they're doing this. And they end up having, you know, reaching this reward, which is ultimately fulfilling to them, even though it's not the path they actually uh, follow. In the same way, uh, th that's a benign version of the story. Um, it also, <laughs> I mean, it's the case that when you think about these design problems, you're also, you know, sort of, you know, you're sort of at this interface with things that are sort of deceptive practices, right? You can induce someone to put a huge amount of money into something by constantly sort of exploiting their present bias to make them think that they're reaching a reward and there's something wrong about that. So, you know, this is, this is sort of a values neutral structure that says, you know, this can be used, you know, to help people accomplish what they want to accomplish. It can also sort of lead people on to, into bad directions. So, a number of interesting questions here. It turned out that this was the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there were sort of two independent pr proofs, one by 
or, or, or Ifaiga, one by the aforementioned paper of Tung et al., that actually uh, just this basic problem, can I delete nodes to make this graph traversable, uh, is, is an NP-hard problem, uh, NP-complete. Um, and it suggests a number of interesting open questions. Maybe the easiest one to state is, suppose I give you an instance that's not traversable. It's NP-hard to decide if I can delete nodes to be traversable. Um, suppose there were a way with reward R star to delete some nodes make it traversable, and I allow you to, say, increase the reward to 2 R star. Can you then, in polynomial time, find a way to delete nodes, right? So can I do some kind of an approximation where I inflate the reward slightly, and now it becomes much more tractable to figure out how to do that? Uh, not something that we understand very well at the moment. OK. Uh, and that brings me to the end. You know, as with all these things, there's kind of a sort of, you know, movement from looking at cases in, in the world where we see uh, rewards, see people following them, trying to think about models of what might, might, might be going on. Starting with models where there's sort of a simple discounting of the future and we can look at dynamic programming solutions and then sort of trying to sort of in richer ways exploit, uh, exploit behavioral biases. And even though, you know, the way in which we, you know, added the behavioral bias in this case was, you know, very simple to state. It's just taking a traditional short path problem and adding one extra feature. It produces these incredibly rich behaviors um, and not just rich subjectively to us, but the fact that, you know, relatively simple seeming tasks become NP complete in this model suggests some of the, the complexity gets introduced when you just introduce this one little bias. So I think there's a lot of interesting questions uh, left open. Let me just um, suggest a couple of them. You know, this question of where does the actual value reside in the, in the rewards? Right? Is it social? Is it motivational? Transactional? How does it work when you're designing for people with a mix of different motivations, a mix of different biases, potentially? Um, sophisticated agents, I promised I would have one bullet about this. Uh, uh, so there's this very nice work of O'Donohue and Raven about agents who are aware of their own time and consistency. They still want to procrastinate, but they're aware that that's going, that, that is also going to be happening in the future. And so they can then, in this way, avoid the worst of it. Um, and uh, in some ongoing work that Segal and I are doing with Manish Raghavan, uh, it, it turns out there are nice ways to incorporate sophistication into this graph, graph theoretic model, and you get a whole set of interesting uh, uh, further results there. Um, multiplayer settings. Uh, Obviously, this is sort of one agent making decisions about a graph. We can imagine agents inter interacting with various levels of uh, bias and sophistication. Um, and finally, you know, obviously, it's going to be interesting to sort of go back into some of these questions about badges in, in these online systems, you know, and think about, you know, how do these ideas around bias and how do these other ideas around long-range planning uh, help us better understand, you know, what's taking place in these systems, right, as they become richer, as they become more deeply uh, embedded in our in our everyday lives, I think the algorithmic questions of how we design for them, how we take into account reasonable models of, of agent behavior and what that implies computationally, I think those are all going to be very interesting questions going forward. Thanks very much. So just in, in regards to the last point that you made, John, so sophisticated agents, once we have a sophisticated agent, we can design commitment-like devices. Um, have you got anything to say about whether you can begin to look at that in your new framework with sophisticated agents? Yeah, so you, you actually can, can, can say some interesting things about uh, commitment devices now. So for example, if you offer people, so some examples, if you offer people the ability to in, inject cost at the outset to help prevent bad behavior in the future, uh, you, you can actually some, sometimes in, incur wins uh, that way. Obviously, you know, with commitment, commitment devices, you know, you know, in a way, one sort of foreshadowing of it is uh, here is sort of the designer in, in these stories, like with choice reduction. The designer is sort of forcibly imposing a commitment device on a person who's unable to sort of think of it for themselves. Um, with the agent who's sophisticated, you, you could have them be creating sophisticated, right? So you, you could ask them to engage in choice reduction at the beginning. Suppose I could pay to engage in choice reduction, right? So I have to like pay for the software that's going to block web browsing to certain sites after 10 p.m. But having done that, then I'm more productive after 10 p.m. Uh, I could pay to you know put my money into something that you know limits my freedom, but and and so forth. So we, we actually look at these these uh, trade-offs and commitment devices, and I think yeah, it becomes it. It looks to us like it becomes possible to do that once you have once you have certification. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so with respect to commitment devices, uh, uh, I was wondering if, say, from the literature uh, or from your own experiments on say Coursera, if you have seen whether this how much of this procrastination is for doing nothing in its place or doing another task in its place, and if <laughs> there is a significant component of the latter, then 
can this framework be used to jointly model multiple tasks and multiple rewards? Yeah, interesting question, right? So, so right, the question is, can it? Uh, are we seeing people do nothing versus doing doing other tasks? You know, so. In some sense, we, uh, when, when you think abstractly about what is the space of possible activities, you know, even nothing is some choice. Of it, right? It's not clear what nothing would mean here. Um, it is the case that this idea of trading off among activities is going to be interesting to, to, to put into the model. Uh, there's nothing a priori impossible of doing that. You know, you could imagine some multi-dimensional graph where if I move in this dimension, and that's effectively what the state space uh, model was doing. If I move in this dimension, making progress on this side. If I move in this dimension, on some other side. Um, you know, the challenge with looking at, at any one site is you can look at how they're trading off act on activities within the site. You can look at total time on site. Um, you can't know what they're doing necessarily off the site uh, unless you're looking at some larger enclosing context. Um, so I think those are all, all going to be interesting, but at some level, putting that into the model, you know, it sort of adds an extra dimension. The graph becomes uh, richer, but that kind of trading off is certainly something. Uh, and you know, and you, you could imagine uh, something much richer than this, where maybe I have different levels of present bias for different activities, uh, and then you know, have those trade off is another interesting question. You also have any? Yeah. Have you or the literature looked at the case of the opposite bias, which is the aversion to procrastination? The, yeah, we looked a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, so we actually, um, uh, actually, in the, in this work that we're doing now, we looked at uh, bounds you can get on future bias stations, which say. I sort of I want to front load activity. Um, now, of course, that too can lead to suboptimal behavior. Um, but it turns out you, for example, can't get exponentially bad instances in that case. Uh, so you can't. You can, you can do suboptimally, but it can't somehow cascade. Uh, and so one can prove better upper bounds. I mean, at the level of worst case, on a given instance, uh, future bias could be worse than present bias on an instance per instance basis. But the worst case of one is not as bad as the worst case of the other. On the badges topic, it seems like there's some simple econometric things you could do to shed light on where the value of badges is coming from. So to the, to the extent that the badges are valuable because they, uh, because users in a community value other, others in the community knowing that they're good contributors, you'll see a discontinuity in effort on a particular task before and after the award of the badge. So you'll, you'll see a discontinuity effect right, right at a, whatever the badge threshold is. To the extent that people value badges because they're just good guys, they want to be pro-social in this community, and the badge is signaling to them what kind of behavior this community values. So I should do A, not B, because A is badged and B is mm -hmm. not. You can just look at well, when a new badge comes online, that should steer behavior, even yep. for guys kind of far away from the badge threshold. Yeah. It seems like there's some simple no, I agree. off the shelf microeconometric things you could do to Get it, get it these different, and un unpack the VB a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that's gonna be As we start looking at these systems that have richer sets of badges and where badges are being introduced over, over, over time, it, it gives a lot of opportunities for doing that. I mean, there are these interesting cases where discontinuities can happen for multiple reasons. So, for example, if I want people to be impressed that I have a badge, then once I have it, I stop putting effort into that. On the other hand, if I had set that as a kind of mental goalpost, like, you know, you know, it's sort of, it's gonna be meaningful to me if I can do 100 of these edits, then once I also might see a, a discontinuity. And so, certain of them, you know, discontinuities won't resolve among those, those, those particular things. But there are definitely, you know, I think sort of um, systems that have richer sets of, of badges and just sort of more people achieving each of them is gonna be yeah, a big opportunity for those. So, yeah, it, it'd be great to talk more about, about some of those. So, coming back to the, the badges, I find it hard to believe that individuals are actually calculating the time discounting. And I wonder if there's a simpler approximation going on, like time discounting over three steps and then it's zero beyond it's, that. Could that be teased out from the data? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and again, you know, there's the, the, the a question about sort of how far in advance am I ramping up, ramping up my activity. Um, yeah, it, it certainly, I mean, I don't think there's any, as with any of these models where one's modeling some kind of optimal decision plan, um, I don't think there's any claim that one's sort of doing the exact calculation uh, and trying to do the optimum. But yeah, the question of, you know, am I only discounting, say, so if it's far enough out, in the, but I, I guess the question would be if it, I'd have to model somehow that a badge that's far in the future still has some meaning to me. So it's not that it's zero. Maybe I sort of, so the discount would have to be like, maybe only three steps out it starts gaining in value. Um, we'd have to think how to handle that. But, because I, I mean, it, it does seem like, uh, you would want something that says there's an overall effect that a, a, a awareness of the badge is doing something, uh, but sort of over what time scale, you know, the sort of change in 
CLAs is taking place is, is a good question. Thanks again.